Welcome to our Bible study for February 19th. This is Transfiguration Sunday, and that's pretty important because our lesson covers the Transfiguration, but what it really covers is just what happens before the Transfiguration. Our youth group is in San Antonio this weekend at the Cumberland Presbyterian Youth Evangelism Conference. And so I guess I just kind of have San Antonio on the brain. Uh, but I was thinking a little bit today as I was looking over this lesson about a television show that my wife Lee and I like to watch. It's 911 San Antonio. And it's about a fire department and first responders in San Antonio. And uh, it's kind of a silly show in some ways because uh, they get in all of these situations that you can't imagine really happening in San Antonio. For example, a, a while back there was one where these people were at a mini golf course in San Antonio and a literal volcano erupts there and there's lava everywhere and people are running to high ground to get away from the lava and the fire department has to come out and try to save people from the volcano. Well, that's just not very likely to happen in San Antonio. And one of the things that they often do that just drives me crazy in this show is they kind of start at the ending and then take you back to the beginning. So for the volcano show, it starts with these people playing uh, mini golf, you know, the, the show begins, and then the volcano erupts, and there's lava everywhere, and then it stops, and it says, eight hours earlier, and it, it rewinds all the way back to, to eight hours earlier or whatever, and, and that always drives me crazy. Let's just see this in chronological order. Uh, however, having said that, I want to kind of do uh, that sort of a thing today. Our lesson is actually uh, Matthew 16, uh, verses 21 through uh, 17, and the, the account of the transfiguration. And I want to begin with the first two verses in chapter 17. And you'll, you'll catch that, that little, uh, what happened earlier, right there in there. Because uh, chapter 17 begins with, six days later... Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became bright as light. So that's six days later. So now I want us to back up and we're going to look at the six days uh, before. And so now we're going to back, back up from what happened before uh, the transfiguration. And this reads beginning with the 21st verse. From that time on, and, and I should mention from that time on is after Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. When Jesus asked, who do people say that, that I am? Who do you say that I am? Well, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance for me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what, they have, for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And, of course, there's been a lot of, of controversy, really, about that final uh, verse there. Some won't taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And they say, well, all of the disciples died. They're, they're not here anymore. They never saw the second coming. But Jesus really, I think, there is talking about the resurrection. That is when he really comes into his kingdom. But we're not going to get quite that far uh, today. Certainly not as far as the resurrection, but even to that verse I want us instead to, to think about the fact that Peter has made this amazing confession. And they are making their way, where, where Peter recognizes the glory of God is in Jesus. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And, and we're making our way to uh, probably Mount Tabor for the, the, the transfiguration, where Jesus is revealed in all of his glory. Those things that Peter had already confessed are obviously the case. And Peter will write of them again, 
when he writes Second Peter, assuming it was Peter who wrote it, Peter or one of his disciples, but he writes again of, of that thing, uh, that event up there on the mountain. But six days before, Jesus says that uh, he, uh, they need to go to Jerusalem. Now, Peter's just made this confession, and Peter is pretty sure he understands what that means. Going to Jerusalem means that Jesus, in one way or another, is going to take over the temple. Uh, the temple is really both the theological and the political capital, if you will, of, of Israel. Jesus will take over the temple, throw out the religious leaders, the scribes and the chief priests and, and, and who not, all, all of the leaders, and then he can rally the people from there, and then they will, will rally, and then they will be able to throw out the, the Romans, and everything that Peter has been looking for all of his life for the Messiah to come will happen. Israel will be a sovereign nation again, and they can then be the nation they want to be. The Romans won't be there, and, and maybe even can begin to fulfill their their uh, call to, to bring all nations to God uh, through them. God's going to sh- do many mighty works uh, through Jesus in this political takeover that is going to happen when Jesus goes to Jerusalem. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? Jesus says he must go to Jerusalem in order to suffer under the chief priests and the scribes. He says that he must suffer under the religious leaders and that they will kill him. And he says that he will rise again on the third day, but clearly Peter doesn't hear that part at all. And Peter simply says, God forbid it. And in a sense, Peter says, I forbid it. That's not going to happen. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. Uh, rather, you're supposed to go and take over. That's what the Messiah is supposed to do. And Jesus utters those famous painful uh, words to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And it's actually exactly the same sentence that Jesus utters to Satan uh, there in the wilderness earlier back in Matthew 4 uh, when Satan is tempting Jesus. And the reason I think Jesus is saying this to Peter is Peter is essentially tempting Jesus with the same thing Satan was. Jesus, look after yourself and you've got great power, so use that great power to harm your enemies and to save yourself, to harm your enemies, to get rid of your enemies, and to elevate yourself. And Jesus says to Peter, the problem here is that you have your mind on earthly things and not on heavenly things. And the way that God goes about things is so different than the way the earth, the, 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 the world uh, goes about things. And so Jesus says, here's the way, another way. If you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. And of course, taking up your cross literally means just what Jesus is going to do in Jerusalem, taking your cross and dragging it up Golgotha so that others can crucify you. It is allowing others uh, to abuse and hate you and, and allowing that to happen in a self-sacrificial, loving way and even praying, uh, Father, forgive them as they do this beastly uh, thing to you. Take up your cross in order to save it. Lose your, I mean, in order to follow me. Lose your life if you want to save it. Give up everything in order to gain even more. And no wonder uh, we are a little bit like Peter there. Lord, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, and, and I will certainly confess that, that I feel that way uh, um, uh, more often than not, uh, I would say. But we need to be aware of what Jesus, how he, he might respond to us. Uh, N.T. Wright says that one way to look at this passage is think about if we're learning to swim and we're in a, a, a pool that has a gradual downhill towards the, uh, the deep end or a lake that's going to gradually get deeper and deeper and we can keep our feet on the bottom for a while but if we want to swim eventually we have to take our feet up off the bottom and if we want to go out into the deep water eventually we have to get out over our heads but going out over our heads means that we do kind of literally sink or swim. We drown or we swim, but that's the only way we can do it. You cannot swim as long as your feet are still on the bottom. Uh, even if you just leave one foot on the bottom, you still cannot swim. That uh, Reading that and, and reflecting on that reminded me here at First Cumberland, uh, during the summertime when our day player kids take swimming lessons, there comes the day that all the kids that have passed their, their swimming test, they get to jump off the diving board for the first time. And jumping off the diving board in our swimming pool means jumping into 12-foot deep water. Uh, there are none of our campers that are 12 feet tall, as, as you might imagine. None of us are 12 feet tall, tall either. And so you're jumping into water way over your head, and you're on that diving board, and so you can't just reach over and grab the, the edge of the pool. you got to jump, and you got to swim. However... 
on diving board day, there are always lifeguards in the water right there at the bottom of the diving board, encouraging, saying, come on and jump. And uh, it is uh, sometimes painful to watch as kids stand on the edge of that board. Their toes are curled on that board. They're holding that board as tight as they can. They're so afraid to jump, but yet they have to. If they're going to get in the water, if they're going to swim, they have to jump. But the wonderful news is that, that everybody keeps trying to tell them, the least or most of all, the, the, the lifeguard, that I'm right here. I'm going to catch you. And that's what Jesus is telling us as well and promising us. I'm right here. You can pick up your cross. That is so hard. That's jumping into the deep end. You can, you can uh, lose your life for my sake. And that is so hard. Uh, but you can do it because I am right here and I will catch you. What does that mean? Let's put some feet to that, if you will, or, or maybe not put feet to it, but jump into the deep end. What does that mean for us, uh, not in a figurative way, but in a literal way? And it really does mean putting others ahead of ourselves, but it's not just any old others. Back when we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, if you just love those that love you, you're no better than anybody else. You have to love your enemies. You have to put your enemies ahead of you, your enemies' welfare ahead of you. And that is so hard. And we can see why Jesus says to Peter, your mind is on earthly things, not on heavenly things, because that's not the way it works on the earth. In the earth, if we have an enemy, we go against that enemy and we challenge that enemy. And we certainly don't look for their good. We look for, at best, just to avoid them. And at worst, we look for their ill. And yet, what happens, what, what Jesus tells us is that we have to love our enemies. I think when Christians and the church tend to go off course, it's when we think that uh, we identify enemies, and there are enemies of the church, and there are people who hate the church. And I think there are actually probably many, many more people who don't hate the church, uh, or, or at least are not a, a, an active enemy of the church, but they just are either disinterested or they have been hurt by the church, and they just want nothing whatsoever uh, to do with the church, or perhaps they are completely unlike us uh, who are in the church, uh, the way they live their lives or whatever, and we label them as enemies. And we go off course when we decide that we know we have enemies, and now we have to go to war with those enemies. That's thinking in an earthly way. Had Jesus chosen to go to war, he could have. Uh, we know he is glorified there on that mountain. He has all of the power uh, of, of, of God there on that mountain. Uh, the scriptures tell us that had he chosen to, he could have called down legions of angels to save him from the Romans. He isn't a, an, an innocent, uh, a, a helpless victim. He is rather an innocent, willing victim. He allows the Romans uh, to crucify him. He, he gives his life in self-sacrificial love. And as he does, he prays, Father, forgive them as they are pounding nails into his feet and into his hands. Now, if someone's pounding nails, either literally or figuratively, into you or into me, it's going to be very hard for us to seek their good. Very hard for us to pray, Father, uh, forgive them. We're going to want to find a way to hit back. We're going to want to find a way to to lash out. And um, we may, like Peter, kind of say, I'm not going to permit it. I won't let that happen to me. And I do think we need to recognize that we are not called to court abuse and to, to seek out hatred. And we also aren't, uh, aren't called necessarily to just accept it whenever it, it comes our way. Uh, the classic example is, as a pastor, I've been trained. Uh, I would never tell a woman who's being abused by her husband, now, honey, you just need to go home and forgive him because that's what Jesus says that you need to do. You go home and you love him and you forgive him. No, it doesn't work that way. One of the ways that she can actually show that she loves him is to say, I'm setting boundaries up. You're not allowed to come through those boundaries. I'm doing things to protect myself and perhaps particularly to protect our children. Um, but uh, possibly, if the husband can get the help that, that he needs, uh, possibly there could be reconciliation. But, but what she is not called to do is go to war against him. Um, now, she may need to go to court and, and make sure that her rights are protected and that kind of thing, uh, but she can't go to war against him. She just has to find ways to protect herself without actively trying to, uh, to harm him. But that also is an illustration that is a little bit in the extreme uh, because most of us don't experience that kind of thing and we are so much more quick to go to war with those who might be our enemies instead of finding ways to self-sacrificially love them. And that is hard. And the only way we can possibly do it is to do what Jesus says, pick up your cross 
and follow me. Let me, not me, but let Christ give you the strength that you need to do all of those things that you need to do so that, like Christ, we can show that our minds are on heaven and that we know that even when it looks like we lose, when, when, when we lose face, when we are shamed, when, when the other thinks they have won, God takes that defeat and can turn it into a tremendous, tremendous victory. So the, all of this happens with Peter and Jesus and this strange saying about uh, pick up your cross and follow me. And then six days later, Jesus is transfigured. And then we begin the journey towards Golgotha, the journey towards Jerusalem. And uh, this is one of those times when uh, uh, it's almost kind of like a TV show. You need to see the next episode. And the next episode is the sermon for this week in which we look at the transfiguration and we look at the transfiguration in light of what happened at Calvary, what happens on uh, that other hill, Golgotha. And so I invite you uh, to consider how you might respond to this, this lesson I've just taught, but also I invite you to watch the sermon for this week or if able, uh, come to our church and, and see it live uh, because that is uh, the next installment, if you will, in what Jesus would have us to do and how we are to respond and how we are to move into Lent as a church. I'm so glad that you were with me this day and I leave you with this blessing. Know that God is with you.